This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Beyond the Bayou by Kate Chopin The bayou curved like a crescent around a point of land on which La Folle's cabin stood. Between the stream and the hut lay a big abandoned field where cattle were pastured when the bayou supplied them with water enough. Through the woods that spread back into unknown regions, the woman had drawn an imaginary line, and past this circle she never stepped. This was the form of her early mania. She was now a large, gaunt black woman, past thirty-five. Her real name was Jacqueline, but everyone on the plantation called her La Folle, because in childhood she had been frightened literally out of her senses, and she had never wholly regained them. It was when there had been skirmishing and sharpshooting all day in the woods. Evening was near, when Petit Maître, black with power and crimson with blood, had staggered into the cabin of Jacqueline's mother, his pursuers close at his heels. The sight had stunned her childish reason. She dwelt alone in her solitary cabin, for the rest of the quarters had long since been removed beyond her sight and knowledge. She had more physical strength than most men, and made her patch of cotton and corn and tobacco like the best of them. But of the world beyond the bayou she had long known nothing, save what her morbid fancy conceived. People at Bellissim had grown used to her and her way, and they thought nothing of it. Even when old Miss died, they did not wonder that La Folle had not crossed the bayou, but had stood up on her side of it wailing and lamenting. Petit Maître was not the owner of Bellissim. He was a middle-aged man with a family of beautiful daughters about him and a little son whom La Folle loved as if he had been her own. She called him Sherry and so did everyone else because she did. None of the girls had ever been to her what Sherry was. They had each and all loved to be with her and to listen to her wondrous stories of things that always happened yonder, beyond Bayou. But none of them had stroked her black hand quite as Sherry did, nor rested their heads against her knees so confidently, nor fallen asleep in her arms as he used to do. For Sherry hardly did such things now, since he had become the proud possessor of a gun and had had his black curls cut off. That summer, the summer Sherry gave La Folle two black curls tied with a knot of red ribbon. The water ran so low in the bayou that even little children at Bellissim were able to cross it on foot and the cattle were sent to pasture down by the river. La Folle was sorry when they were gone, for she loved this dumb companions well, and liked to feel that they were there and to hear them browsing by night up to her own enclosure. It was Saturday afternoon, when the fields were deserted. The men had flocked to a neighboring village to do their week's trading, and the women were occupied with household affairs, La Folle as well as the others. It was when she mended and washed her handful of clothes, scored her house, and ate her baking. In this last employment she never forgot Sherry. Today she had fashioned croaking nose of the most fantastic and alluring shapes for him. So, when she saw the boy come trudging across the old field with his gleaming new rifle on his shoulder, she called out gaily to him, Sherry! Sherry! But Sherry did not need summons, for he was coming straight to her. His pockets all bulged out with almonds and raisins and an orange that he had secured for her from the very fine dinner which had been given that day up at his father's house. He was a sunny-faced youngster of ten. When he had emptied his pockets, La Folle patted his round red cheek, wiped his soiled hands on her apron and smoothed his hair. Then she watched him as, with his cakes in his hand, he crossed a strip of cotton back of the cabin and disappeared into the wood. He had boasted of the things he was going to do with his gun out there. You think they got plenty deer in the wood, La Folle? He had inquired, with the calculating air of an experienced hunter. No, no, the woman laughed. Don't you look for no deer, Cherry. 
that's too big. But you bring Lofol one good fat squirrel for her dinner tomorrow, and she gonna be satisfied. One squirrel went a bit. I'll bring you more than one, Lofol. He had boasted pompously as he went away. When the woman, an hour later, heard the report of the boy's rifle close to the wood's edge, she would have thought nothing of it if a sharp cry of distress had not followed the sound. She withdrew her arms from the tub of suds in which they had been plunged, dried up her, her apron, and as quickly as her trembling lips would bear her, hurried to the spot whence the ominous report had come. It was as she feared. There she found Cherry stretched upon the ground with his rifle beside him. He moaned piteously. I'm dead, Lafol, I'm dead, I'm gone. No, no, she exclaimed resolutely as she knelt beside them. Put your arm round Lafol's neck, Cherry. That's nothing, that's nothing, that's gonna be nothing. She lifted him in her powerful arms. Cherry had carried his gun muzzled downward. He had stumbled, he did not know how. He only knew that he had a ball lodged somewhere in his leg and he thought that this was, that his hand was at the end. Now, with his head up on a woman's shoulder, he moaned and wept with pain and fright. Oh, Lafol, Lafol, it hurts so bad, I can't stand it, Lafol. Don't cry, mon babe, mon babe, mon chéri. The woman spoke soothingly as she covered the ground with long strides. Lafol gonna mind you. Dr. Bonfils gonna come make mon chéri well again. She had reached the abandoned field. As she crossed it with her precious burden, she looked constantly and restlessly from side to side. A terrible fear was upon her. The fear of the world beyond by you. The morbid and insane dread she had been under since childhood. When she was at the bayou's edge, she stood there and shouted for help as if her life depended upon it. Oh, petit maître, petit maître, venez donc, au secours, au secours. No voice responded. Sherry's hot tears were scanned in her neck. She called for each and every one up in the place, and still no answer came. She shouted, she wailed, but whether her voice remained unheard or undid, no reply came to her frenzied cries. And all the while, Cherry moaned and wept, and entreated to be taken home to his mother. La Folle gave a last despairing look around her. Extreme terror was upon her. She clasped the child close against her breast, where he could feel her heart beat like a muffled hammer. Then, shutting her eyes, she ran slowly down the shallow bank of the bayou, and never stopped till she had climbed the opposite shore. She stood there, quivering an instant, as she opened her eyes. Then she plunged into the footpath through the trees. She spoke no more to Cherry, but muttered constantly, Bon Dieu, aie petit ma faux, bon Dieu, aie petit moi. Instinct seemed to guide her. When the path was straight, clear and smooth enough before her, she again closed her eyes tightly against the sight of that unknown and terrifying world. A child, playing in some weeds, caught sight of her as she neared the quarters. The little one watched her cry of dismay. La Folle! she screamed in her piercing treble. La Folle, then crossed the bayou! Quickly the cry passed down the line of cabins. Yonda! La Folle, then crossed the bayou! Children, old men, old women, young ones with infants in their arms, flocked to doors and windows to see this awe inspiring spectacle. Most of them shuddered with superstitious dread of what it might pretend. She took ton chéri, some of them shouted. Some of the more daring gathered about her and followed at their heels, only to fall back with new terror when she turned her distorted face up on them. Her eyes were bloodshot and the saliva had gathered in a white foam on her black lips. Someone had run ahead of her to where Petit Maître sat with his family and guests up in the gallery. Petit Maître, la folle then crossed the bayou, look her! Look her yonder totten chere. This startling intimation was the first which they had of the woman's approach. She was now near at hand. She walked with long strides. 
Her eyes was fixed desperately before her, and she breathed heavily as a tired ox. At foot the, at the stairway, which she could not have mounted, she laid the boy in her father's arms. Then the world had looked red till a fall suddenly turned black, like that day she had never seen powder and blood. She reeled for an instant. Before a sustained arm could reach her, she fell heavily to the ground. When the fall regained consciousness, she was at home again, in her own cabin and up her own bed. The moon rays, streaming in through the open door and windows, gave what light was needed to the old black mammy who stood at the table concocting a tisane of fragment herbs. It was very late. Others who had came and felt that stupor clung to her had gone again. But it met had been there and with him Dr. Bonfields, who had said that Le Fol might die. But death had passed her by. The voice was very clear and steady, with which she spoke to Tante Lisette, brewing her tisane there in a corner. If you'll give me one of those drink tisane, Tante Lisette, I believe I'm gonna sleep me. And she did sleep, so soundly, so healthfully, that all is at, when her compunction stole softly away, to creep back through the moonlit fields to her own cabin, in the new quarters. The first touch of the cold grey morning awoke a fall. She arose, calmly, as if no tempest had shaken and threatened her existence but yesterday. She turned her new blue cottonette and white apron, for she remembered that this was Sunday when she had made for herself a cup of strong black coffee and drank it with relish, she quitted the cabin and walked across the old familiar field to the bayou's edge again. She did not stop there as she had always done before, but crossed with a long, steady stride as if she had done this all her life. When she had made her way through the brush and scrub cottonwood trees that lined the opposite bank, she found herself at the upon the border of a field where the white, bursting cotton, with dew upon it, gleamed for acres and acres like frosted silver in the early dawn. La Folle drew a long, deep breath as she gazed across the country. She walked slowly and uncertainly, like one who hardly knows how, looking about her as she went. The cabins that yesterday had sent a clamor of voices to pursue her were quiet now, no one was yet to steer at Bellissim. Only the birds that darted here and there from edges were awake and singing their matins. When La Folle came to the broad stretch of velvety lawn that surrounded the house, she moved slowly and with light over the springy turf that was delicious beneath her tree. She stopped to find whence came those perfumes that were assailing her senses with memories from a time far gone. There they were, stealing up to her from the thousand blue violets that peeped out from green luxuriant beds. There they were, showering down from the big waxen bells of the magnolias far above her head, and from the jasmine clumps around her. There were roses too, without number. To right and left, palms spread in broad and graceful curves. It all looked like enchantment beneath the sparkling sheen of dew. When Lafal had slowly and cautiously mounted the many steps that led up to the veranda, she turned to look back at the perilous ascent she had made. Then she caught sight of the river, bending like a silver bow at the foot of Bellissim. Exultation possessed her soul. Lapol rapped softly upon a door near at hand. Sherry's mother soon cautiously opened it. Quickly and cleverly, she dissembled the astonishment she felt at seeing La Folle. Ah, La Folle, is it you? So early. Oui, madame. I come ask, ask how my poor little Sherry do this morning. It's feeling easier, thank you, La Folle. Dr. Bonfield says it will be nothing serious. He's sleeping now. Will he come back when he awakes? No, madame. I'm gonna wait here till Sherry wake up. La Folle seated herself upon the topmost step of the veranda. A look of wonder and deep contempt crept into her face as she watched for the first time the sun rise upon the new, the beautiful world beyond the bayou.
End of Beyond Bayou by Kate Chopin.